All right, we're at least at 2.30, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, people walk in, that's fine too. People join us on Zoom, that's fine too. Uh, we kind of have a real rough outline of what we're gonna go over here today. So, you know, if you have questions, comments, whatever, feel free to bring those up here. I mean, this is, you know, this is not where we're trying to fit on an exact schedule, that kind of thing. However, I will say that uh, we're, lost track of my train of thought and more people walked in, sorry. Um, we, we put this on today's session. If you're been using BayoCat for a while, this today's session will probably bore you quite a bit. It, we're really gonna kind of hit the basics today. Wednesday's session is, is, is much more in depth. So if, if you get through here and you say, wow, they're covering nothing that I'm getting anything out of, feel free, you're not gonna offend me if you go, whatever. Um, generally speaking, people that won't show up to today's won't show up to Wednesday's, people that show up to Wednesday's won't show up to today's because they're really aimed at two target audiences. Today, you know, you, if, you, if, you, if you're truly new to this, Wednesday stuff will probably be too advanced for you, you won't be ready for that. If, uh, and if we don't, Today, and if you're more advanced, you're probably going to be bored through your skull here today. Uh, would you put the records online and accessible? If not, may I record you? I am recording this right now. So, I w and we will put these back up later on the online. Uh, people on Zoom, go ahead and, and use the chat if you, if you need to communicate with us. And uh, I think we we'll probably have some people in here on chat also so that, you know, we can bring those up. Um, let me introduce myself first. My name is Kyle Hudson. Uh, I'm probably the most vocal of the uh, Baocat staff. I'm, I'm the extrovert of the group, so that's why I have the microphone on. Um, that doesn't mess, necessarily mean I'm the most knowledgeable, but uh, so here with me too, we have Dave. Why don't you come over? And Dave, Dave, Dave can be seen on the camera. For the people out there that aren't there, so that's Dave. Uh, he's the guy who you'll probably respond to you most with user type questions. Uh, I see, I see some nods. That means you probably worked with him before. He's, he's real good about helping people with optimizing code. The other one I have, we have here, is Adam Tigert, and he is our other system administrator and the more senior of us system administrators. He's been here for ten years now, pretty close. Yeah, ten years. Ten years this year. So he knows his way in and out of, of what's going on here. So just gonna take a quick look at what we're covering here. Uh, the other person who's usually with us here is Dan Andreessen. You've probably seen lots of emails from Dan. Uh, he is out of town today. His father is in the hospital and he was planning on being here, gonna welcome everybody to this session, that kind of thing, but he's not around due to family emergency type thing. So we're doing as we, as we can without him here. And we really have a lot of people here. I'm kind of sur surprised that <laughs> the room is this full and the, and the uh, Zoom is that full too. So has everyone gotten set up on Zoom that's over here? Do you have any technical issues? Let us know. Okay, is there anybody who does not yet have a Bayocat account? You, you do have one? Oh, we have a couple, excellent. That, that, that's fine, that, we're, we're here to help. Um, the first thing you wanna do, and I'm going to see, like I said, I'm not the most Zoom proficient guy out there, so I'm going to say. You click that, it shares everything on your desktop and well, whatever apps you pull up. Okay, that's what I want then. Like I said, I've, I've used it as a client before, I've never set up a meeting my own, of my own here. Um, so what I brought up here is our main website, and that's what we're gonna be going off of quite a bit here today, is if you go to baocat.ksu.edu, it'll bring you straight to here. And this is kind of where we base everything off of. Uh, we try to document everything here. This is a wiki, by the way. So if you are a Baocat user, you can click the login button up here, put in your EID, username and password, and you can, change our documentation. We have some sections that we don't let people change for obvious reasons. 
uh, like our policies, for instance. We don't want anybody going in and changing our policies, things like that. But if you see a, something here that's not documented well, or you see a better way of uh, presenting material, feel free to log in and change this. We monitor that, so try not to get too much, you know, graffiti and that kind of thing in there. But, and, and it hasn't happened yet. We, I think we've had, what, two people besides ourselves? Is it, yeah. is it only one? Yeah, that have, go, that have gone in and made some changes here, but we welcome you to do that. So th this is a wiki, if you use Wikipedia, it uses the same backend engine as that. Uh, so we can get to there. On this page, about halfway down, there's a thing that says how to get an account. And if we click on that, that takes you to account.bayocat.ksu.edu. You do have to log in, and that takes your K-State EID and password. Um, you fill out the form from there, I'm not gonna do that, mainly because I don't know my password and it would take me longer to look it up and log in than anything else. But, and we go through the same page to approve your accounts. What, the process that happens is once you apply for an account, uh, that gets sent out to Dan, who reviews it, and then he tells us yay or nay, and I think he's had maybe one nay in the whole time I've been here. And that was for somebody that was, I think it was a, a spam, a listing of some sort that somebody was obviously not not needing an account not wanting really wanting an account just to fill out the form or whatever um, so if you have any plausible reason Dan approves it uh, we go through the same web interface and we approve it and that automatically creates your accounts adds you to the mailing list serves that kind of thing anything else Adam we need to cover there no. pretty well covers it Uh, connecting to BayoCat. Um, everything through BayoCat, to begin with at least, we'll, we'll talk about one other exception to this, but to connect to BayoCat, we use SSH. SSH is not a program, it's a protocol. Uh, it's like saying, I'm using a web browser. You know, it doesn't matter if you're using Chrome or Edge or Firefox, it's a browser. That's what SSH is, it's kind of like saying a browser. We have specific programs that uh, we can use to, to connect to those SSH sessions. Uh, if you're on a Mac, you already have one built in and it's through the terminal. So if you just open up a terminal, you can go straight to, and you just type SSH, baocat.ksu.edu there. Um, we, on Windows, we have a couple of them. Putty is probably the most common. How many people here use Putty? That's, that's probably the most common one. Um, I found this one a couple of, of years ago. I like it a lot better myself. That's my own personal preference, but this is uh, MOBA Xterm, and it's, it's free to download also. And I'll show you why I like it here in a little bit, because when we go to transfer files, it makes it, uh, it's just kind of a one-stop shop instead of having to have a separate program. If you're using Putty, you have to uh, use one of their helper programs, uh, PSCP or PSFTP, to get files in and out of it or you can use something like FileZilla, which is a nice uh, graphical interface for it. But this combines that all in, into, one, uh, into one interface here. I'm hearing sounds. Is somebody on Zoom? Let me see here if I can. Okay, I'm not seeing it here anymore, so they must have muted themselves. So, to get here, I'm going to show you what this session looks like. Um, to connect on SSH, you SSH to headnode.bayocat.ksu.edu. And those of you who've ever used Bayocat before, except for those couple of you that don't know how accounts yet, that's, you, you probably save those either in Putty as a save session, or if you're, I, I use my daily, uh, laptop is a Mac, so I'm. This is the one. This is what I like on Windows. But if I'm on Mac, I just you know type ssh headnode.bayocat.ksu.edu. Um, you can specify your username, uh, especially if you're on a Mac or Linux box. Then you type your. This is that would be your case state EID. So mine would be Kyle Hudson at headnode.bayocat.ksu.edu. Uh, our, it'll also, you can save a password. Don't necessarily recommend that because uh, that is your EID password. So 
if you're doing that, make sure it's on a machine that you have all to yourself that you're not, you know, if you're, you're confident enough that, you know, if your machine gets taken or whatever, they're not going to be able to get on there because if they get that stuff, they're going to get everything else. I'm going to silence my phone because this is driving me crazy. Do not disturb mode. Have people suddenly decide that I need to Facebook message me right in the middle of my meeting. Hey. Um, that should be all, all it takes to get there. And then after you do log in, it'll ask you for your password. And you can see where I put this up here. I did not specify the username on and Mobix term, so it asked me for my username. But he will do the same thing. Uh, on Mac, if you type, if you don't give it the username, it'll assume that it's whatever username you have on there. So if you have your username the same on your laptop as you do for your EID, then it'll be fine. Otherwise, you have to specify your EID. And we get there, we're, we look at something that looks very much like this. This gives our policies. Uh, note that it's not to be used for classified, personal personally identifiable information, HIPAA data, FERPA data, anything that you know you would get in trouble for 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 sharing. Uh, this is we're not set up for those now. Um, we are looking at the possibility of of making BioCat uh, available to those types of research groups. Those will be on a case by case basis. So before you ever put anything in there, you really need to, to contact us. And we are an email away. We have a ticketing system. And that is also on our website under how do I get help? Right there. Baocat at cs.ksu.edu. We highly encourage you to use that rather than email, emailing one of us directly. We get lots and lots of emails. If you send it to that, ad, that address, it goes into our ticketing system. And that kind of ensures that it doesn't get dropped anywhere along the way. Uh, a lot of people see, you know, obviously you've seen mine. Mine's Kyle Hudson at KSU Edu, um, and people see that. I've had people send me emails directly. Generally, I'll put those at the bottom of the list, even if I do see them. Uh, we all filter our mail quite a bit, and so we highly suggest that you send it to that. That'll that'll get your question answered in the most uh, the most quickly. Because not only will it, you make sure it gets to the right person, because I might not be the right person to ask if you send mail straight to me, and then I have to forward it on to other people. But also, uh, if it's something that any of us can handle, a lot of times you'll get a message back very quickly. There have been a couple of times uh, when I was working here for the first year or so, I remember seeing an email come through about midnight that asked a question. And Adam and I both independently answered it within five minutes by the time the mail system caught up that we didn't, hadn't seen, the other person hadn't seen the other one's response. So you both answered the question at midnight because we both happened to be up and happened to see the question. It was something we could easily answer. So if you send it to that address, that'll, that'll get your answer as, as soon as possible. And actually, you're probably more likely to get Dave at that time of day these days anyway. Dave's, Dave's our, our night owl also. Yeah, well, two in the morning, I might answer. It wouldn't be unheard of. Um, we also are on IRC. For those of you who use IRC, um, I don't. That's not always the fastest way to get a hold of us. We're not always paying that as much attention to that. But if you're already on IRC, feel free to stop by, uh, ping one of us there. We we do answer on that. On, there's a channel called Pound Bayocat. Um, the other piece of this is something that we've had a problem with lately, more, more than we have in the past. And that is that we need to have more information. Saying my program didn't run doesn't help us any. We, we have a really hard, hard time diagnosing my program didn't run. Give us a job ID number, the path name, the script name for the job, and a description of the problem. So tell what you're trying to do, what results you got. It's much different say, if you couldn't get a job to submit as saying your job suddenly stops shortly out, you know, it submits and it runs and it, it then stops. And also your job runs completely through and, but just doesn't give you what you expect. 
When, it says, when you say I, it doesn't work, we don't know which of those cases it is. So give us all that information. If you give us that right off the bat, that'll, that'll really help us to diagnose the problem as quickly as possible and not have to write you back and wait for you to respond and that kind of thing. So we can answer questions a lot, a lot better if you give us that information right up front. Any questions at this point? Especially then, like I just had one come in where the users, I've been working with the user, and she said, well, now this isn't working. I don't know if it's that she did something different or if this is a new problem or a continuation of the old problem. Just all that kind of information that you can give us is out there. Any questions about connecting uh, mobile external? People here with laptops is, and people in Zoom land too. Uh, can you guys, have you guys tried to connect? Can you connect? Are they moving on there? Or do you want to? I don't care if you don't want to. Pardon? Sure. What kind of a system do you have? Uh, it's terrible. Okay. Using Mobex term? Yeah. Okay. So we're gonna, what you're going to do is you're going to click on session up here. It's going to be an SSH session. And the ho remote host is headnode.bayocat.ksu.edu. You don't need the head node right now, but that is subject to change in the future. So we're telling people to use that. That will probably continue to work without the head node on there for a long time, but we, 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 we make no guarantees it will always stay that way. Head node, we guarantee it will stay that way. So if you leave it that way, you're good. All right, anybody in Zoom chat that we need to look at here? I don't see the... I'm monitoring chat. You're monitoring chat? Okay, thank you. All right, so now I'm logged into BayoCat. We're going to talk about Linux itself. So, every supercomputer that I'm aware of at this point runs Linux. I'm not saying there aren't any one offs that run some other flavor of Unix. But they don't run Windows, they don't run Mac. Uh, Microsoft actually tried making a supercomputer back in the, what, 2003-ish, maybe, time frame. And it was a colossal failure, and they said, fine, we don't need to do that. So they, what's that? Well, let's say this is some Unix variant, anyway, if it's, they don't run Linux? Anyway, so to, to use this, you're going to have to know something about Linux. Um, so what you notice, first of all, that's interesting. I have no idea what that is, what the arrows are on the screen. No, it's not. Uh, the first thing you'll notice is that your mouse really has no effect. This is not a point and click interface. This is something you type into. So when you log in, you're presented with your username, the at sign, the system you happen to be logged into. When you go to, uh, your, I, that's great. And, and the head node you had to be logged into. Uh, we have four head nodes that, that we use. And depending on the time, any two are active at a time. So if I was to log in right now, I would be on either Selene or EOS. Uh, we have two more that you might see at some time in the future. Usually those are as we're preparing to go to upgrade a system. So we'll let people in on the, on the new ones as we've upgraded it for a while, and then we'll switch over so everybody logs into those at some point. Uh, so if those ever change, that's, that's what's going on there. Um, they're fairly randomized between them. We do set it up so that if you're from a, uh, a, a fixed desktop where you have a static IP address, you should get to the same one every time. We don't promise that, but, but that's kind of the idea. Most people like having the same thing. 
So we have my username, the at sign, and the, and, the, and the computer I'm on, and then it tells me the directory that I'm in. And the thing you'll see there, the, a directory is very similar to a folder in uh, Windows or Mac. The tilde that you see that we have on the screen there, my mouse is being wonky. I bet the batteries are getting low. The, the tilde before, before that, that tells me I'm in my home directory. If I look at, I can use the command pwd, which is print working directory. And that will show me I am in homes Kyle Hudson. Since my username is Kyle Hudson, that's where, that's where I get dropped into when I first log in. If we go back to our Baocat page, we also have somewhere here, Linux Basics. We have a link to it. Did I miss it? Training videos, new, is it even higher than that? Like I said, if anybody is really good at user, uh, at user interface design, come in here and edit our wiki. <laughs> we are obviously not good at this. This is our second try at it, and it's much better. Second paragraph on how to use Baocat. How to use Baocat. Uh, a little lower. Oh, how do I use Baocat? There we are, Linux Basics. Jeez. All right. <laughs> so this kind of tells you some of the... Uh, the things we we've, we've talked about first of how to log in, uh, giving directions on how to log in from a command line for those of you on Mac or happen to be on Linux. Uh, if you already are on Linux, you probably shouldn't be sitting here today because you're going to be bored. We'll skip the transferring files for, for right now because we're going to talk about basic Linux commands. And we're going to kind of go through this pretty slow. Um, again, at the, at the risk of boring people, but if you, if you miss this part, you're really going to be lost in everything else you do. So we want to make sure we get this down. Um, a directory, say it's a, it's a folder uh, in Windows or in or on OS X. Uh, the current directory you can represent as a dot. So anything time you're talk, referring to your current directory, you can use that just as a period. And directories are separated by slashes. So if you notice back here, the base directory is just a slash. That's what we call, sometimes call the root directory. Beyond that, we have a directory called homes. Then we have a slash saying, saying that it's going to the next directory. And then we have one called Kyle Hudson. I tried to make it larger and I couldn't, I couldn't make it happen. At least not easily. If if you know a shortcut key in Mobex term by chance, let me know. I'll I'll happily make it bigger. Um, to change directories, uh, we use the cd command. So it, I have a lot of directories out there. I'm just going to tell you I have this one out here. It's called uh, Bayo in Baokit intro. Yeah. Baocad intro. Uh, one nice thing about this is that when you are far enough typing a command that it knows what you're, what you're going to finish with, you hit the tab key and it, and it lets you finish. So when I said CD, CD is change directory, and I started typing Baocad, I thought B-E-O, I hit the tab, and it finishes the rest of that because I have no more, no more directories in there that start with B-E-O. So that gets me into that directory. Now you can see instead of having the tilde in there, because I'm not in my home directory, I'm in my Baocad intro directory here. Uh, Linux comes from Unix. Unix has been around since 1969, if I, my memory serves me correct. Back in the early days of computing, memory and storage space was at a premium. 
So you see a lot of things that are abbreviated way beyond what you think they should be. Uh, like I said, for change directory, it's CD, two, two keystrokes. If you want to uh, rename a file, it's move, MV. If you want to uh, remove a directory, RMDIR, or, or for a file, it's RM. There are several of these that, like I said, if you, if you haven't used it before, you're going to be probably lost in it. We try to put lots of these over here on this. We have kind of a cheat sheet and, and ways you can get to uh, some of the most common things you'll see. Uh, so here are some of the most common ones. File, which tells the type of file it is. So I have a file out here called, this is an old PowerPoint. So I say file, intro to BayoCat, BBTX. And it says, hey, I look at that file and I can tell that it's a Microsoft PowerPoint 2007 or newer. I can do file myhost.sh. And it's gonna tell me it's a ASCII text file. That's, that's just it going through and detecting what kind of file it is. It's not perfect, but it does a pretty good job with most things. Cat is, that, that actually comes from concatenate. You can use it to put a bunch of files together, but by itself, it just prints the contents of the file. So that file I just had up there, which I've, I've used for my introduction class here, called myhost.sh, I can say cat myhost.sh. And you can say, you can look at it, this is just everything that's in that file. It's a real short, really short file, has two lines. I've got it there on the screen now. CP for copying. Uh, in Windows, for you guys that are in Windows, a lot of times you'll use the switches as what, the quality, what we call a switch, is a slash at the end of a command. So you'll type a command, slash something else. Uh, in Linux, as, as well as in OS X, if you're using a Mac, uh, they use hyphens. So you can do CP, CP is copy, so you can do CP-I, and that'll ask me if you run into, if I happen to have a file already out there with that name, it's gonna ask me if I wanna overwrite it. CP-R, recursive. So you can copy an old folder to a new folder. Again, MV for move, RM for remove, and creating directories, MKDIR, RMDIR, and touch will either create an empty file or will update the timestamp on your current file. So it'll, it, it makes things as of the current time. Uh, or, it can, or if you just wanna create an absolutely empty file. To get files into and out of BayoCat, there are lots of ways to do this. Uh, the most common way is with some sort of graphical interface, which is what we have here. Mobile Xterm, like I said, this does this as really nice all by itself. Because if I'm over here, it has a tab over here on the side that says SFTP. And I can click on here. This gives me all the files and folders. I told you I had a lot of them out there. So I can go into my directory that says BayoCat intro where I just was. I can click there. And I can take this myhost.sh file, right click and say download. Uh, sure, we'll put it on the desktop because that way I won't forget to, do it, to clean it up when I'm done here. So now, if you look, I now have a, a, a file out here on my desktop called myhost.sh. Let's say that I want to upload something to BayoCat. Um, there's my MOBA Xterm INI file which it just created today when I was, when I, this is a, this, this PC is from, it goes with the room, this isn't my own laptop. So I had to install Mobile Xterm on this today. I can take this and have the, bring up my finder window here, and I can actually just take and drag that over here. So now, there's the file that I had earlier. 
And I just uploaded that to Baocat. As a matter of fact, if I do a director listing here, you'll see that I now have that file mobile external with INI. And if I cat, that's usually fairly short. You can see all the all the preferences that it has that Mobile XTERM set up. I don't really need to have this on Baocat, just showing you how it works. One other really handy command to know about is called less. Uh, less comes because there was a, it becomes less is more. There is a there is an old, old command on Unix called more, and it still works. I can do more Mobile XTERM INI. And it says, this shows me what's at the top of the file. And you see it says, is that my 28%? And it says I have more. Now I hit the space bar and it'll let me see more of the file. So that worked and people used it. But people said, you know what? It's kind of handy sometimes to be able to go back up. So they created less because less is more, right? Yes, programmers have an odd sense of humor. So I now use less mobile external I and I, and it does the same thing, except now I can use my arrow keys to go down. I can use my arrow keys to go up. I can even use the page up and page down keys to look for things in your, inside the file. And I don't need that file anymore, so I'm going to remove it, rm. You notice over here it doesn't change because I haven't told it to check again, but I can hit the refresh button and now it's no longer there. So I've now uploaded a file from Baocat, downloaded a file from Baocat. If you want to do this from the command line, uh, if you're using Macs in particular, uh, I'm not going to go through all how to do this, mainly because I don't have the environment set up here to do this. But if we scroll up on this Linux basics page, there are some examples of using SC, uh, SCP, which is the command line uh, secure copy is what SCP stands for and how to get to the right folders, right directories, and grab the right files. You can even use it to copy entire directory trees too. And you can do that here also. I could take that Baocat intro folder, I'm pretty sure. Uh, let's go up a directory. I think it'll let me do this. Yeah, I can download the whole folder. And you can see it's got 19 files that are just downloaded there. So I now have on my desktop a Baocat intro folder with the same things inside of it. One other handy thing about uh, Mobile XTERM that the other ones don't do, let's go ahead and throw that away, don't need it anymore, is that it has a built-in file editor. So if I go into my Baocat intro folder here, and I want to edit this file. I can, I can edit this in, in Linux. And there are a couple of commands to do that. Probably the one you'll first want to start off using, and Adam's going to kill me for this because it's not really good, is nano. But I can say nano, click, nano, uh, myhost.sh. And there's that file that I've, I've been showing you a couple of times here. And I can just go to the bottom and I can say, do something else. And then it shows me down at the bottom the control keys that I can use to, to do this. So I can do control X to exit. That's the little care X down there. And it's being really intuitive there. So save modified buffer, save, say yes if you want to change it. Ask the file name, by default it keeps it the same, enter. And now, when I cat myhost.sh, I have to do something else on there. If you're going to be using Linux from the command line very much, I highly suggest that you learn VI or Vim. Uh, it's built into to Max also. Uh, it has a learning curve very similar to a brick wall. Uh, it's like the, the uh, somebody looked at uh, Stack Overflow, which is people where people ask programming questions, and there are like over a thousand times people asking, how do I exit VI? 
because it's not at all intuitive when you first get in there. Uh, yes, you can arrow, but you can't do much else with this. Uh, if I try to queue for quit, it doesn't know what I'm doing. And then I'm, I'm tied up, you don't know what you're doing. The secret is there's two modes to it, and then once you know what you're doing, it's, it's, it's a much better text editor than anything else you'll come across once you get over that initial learning curve. There uh, are several uh, online in, uh, tutorials on how to use Vim. I would highly suggest you go through those if you, if you have a chance. Uh, I, say, uh, I use VI and Vim interchangeably. Uh, Vim is VI improved. So VI is visual interactive, is that what it is? Visual interactive editor, visual interface, something like that. It's been around, well, I, I found my notes from when I was an undergrad in 1990. So I know it's been around at least that long. Um, so it, but like I said, so it has a really steep learning curve, but it lets you do really nice things like search and replace is all from the keyboard. And it lets you uh, search through files really quickly. It lets you clap sections and expand sections and you know, replace all instances of, of this with that, that kind of thing. The other nice thing about MOBA XTERM is it has an editor built into it though too. And this is something that you don't get with PuTTY or with FileZilla or any of those. I can right click on my myhost.sh and I can say uh, open with default text editor, which it has its own text editor built in and that is the default. And what it does then is it downloads the file to your machine, lets you open it. I'm going to say another test and when I save it has been modified do you want to replace the remote file yes and then it re-uploads it as soon as it's done so it does it all in one step it downloads it edits on your machine re-uploads it all in one step and now you can see that I have that back in there again Yeah, um, even though they look the same, Windows and Unix use slightly different formats in that uh, it's a, how they use a carriage return. Windows has two types of, uh, they do a control R, control M at the end of every line and as opposed to a control R by itself. So it's, it's basically just how, the, how they put the file together. And we have some commands, DOS to Unix and Unix to DOS that, that'll strip that. So I can say uh, DOS to Unix, DOS being of course a relic of Windows from way, way, way back a long time ago. But I can say DOS to Unix, myhost.sh, and that will strip those off of there. Uh, Mobile Xterm does that automatically, so I didn't really have to do it here. It doesn't ever hurt to, to run it through there. And now I'm gonna go back in and I'm gonna take that line back off there again. So that's kind of a quick introduction on getting files into and out of uh, directory structures. The only thing you really should pay attention to on, on Linux that's a bit different than what you might be used to is permissions. Every file has a set of three permissions. And if I look at this, I'm going to ls-l, ls is, is to do, get a file listing, dash l means along, so I'm gonna look at all the information I have on this. This is the information it gives me on, on my files here. So if I look at myhost.sh, you'll see that, I'll work my way from this side. It was last edited on February 5th at 1508, or 308 in the afternoon, so about a minute ago, that's what we expect. This is its size, it's 19 bytes. These are its owners. By default, your files will be owned by you. So my, the owner of this file is Kyle Hudson, and the group is Kyle Hudson users. There are a few of you in here who are in some groups that you'll get some other uh, groups on here when you, when you uh, edit files. And we set those by default, particularly in certain directories to say, hey, if you're in this directory, 
use this group. You can still own it yourself, but, but have your group uh, be the group owner. And that's relevant because of this over here. There is a section over here that doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense unless you know kind of what's going on. But it becomes very important because we see a lot of this, especially if you're like trying to run somebody else's code, this is the, probably the biggest thing that keeps, keeps that from happening. There are three sections here. The first one is the first column all by itself. And on all, this, all these cases, it's just a dash, which means uh, it's not a directory. There'll be a D in there if there's a directory. Occasionally, they'll come across some other strange things, device files, things like that. 99% of what you deal with and what, we're, and what we're having to worry about is right here. Uh, if I had a directory in here, it'd have a D on the side instead of just a dash. Then the next section is three in a row of RWX, RWX, RWX. And like, for instance, the file that I just had here, the my host, it has RWX, R-X, and R-X. What that means, the first section is for the, for the owner. So that's me. I'm the owner. I'm Kyle Hudson. So this RWX means I have read, write, and execute permission. The next group is for anybody that's in my group, the Kyle Hudson users group. It just so happens there's nobody in my, else in my Kyle Hudson users group. So this, there's nobody really this applies to. But again, for some of you guys who are like bioinformatics, that kind of thing, uh, some, some individual professors have their own groups uh, for their grad students. Uh, if they, can, if they can write to it and you can't and you should be able to, you need to have them change this. Because this means that anybody in my group has read permission and execute permission, but they do not have permission to write that file, so they can't change it. That's handy, as you can, as you can imagine sometimes. You know, I can let people look at my stuff without, letting them, without worrying about them messing it up. The last group is for the rest of the world. So this last R, RWX says it, the entire world can read and execute this file, but cannot write to it. Again, usually you see the least restrictive over here, somewhere in the middle, and then what you want the world to, know, to, to be able to use. I'm not going to go through the ins and outs of change group. I'm pretty sure it's on our page here. On Linux basics, let me look real quick. If not, well, we don't have change group on there. I'll have to add that in there. Or not, I'm saying change ownership, say Joan, which is also not on the, on, on. So, one, you Yeah, there we are. I do it all the time. You'd think I would have the commands down. <laughs> so, this is just real quick, and this, this explains the permissions on this page, the ownership and permissions. This goes over what, in a little more detail of what I've done here too. Uh, but it tells you how to change these. So you can say chmod u plus x, which means I'm giving the user group other is the u, so that's giving myself u plus X, so it means I'm adding the X permission. I'm, I'm giving myself permission to execute it. You can also take that away. So I can say O, which is other, user group other. So it's taking the world, if I'm saying O minus R, that'll say take away read permission from the entire world. There are some groups that like their stuff tightened down. They don't want anybody else to get into it. That's fine. Uh, I will tell you that there are sometimes they want us to troubleshoot problems, and Dave in particular cannot, because Dave is not in any, any of our special groups. He can't get around the permissions models. Uh, Adam and I can. We only do that under certain circumstances, and pretty rarely. And so, usually, if you're wanting us to help troubleshoot a problem, you're going to need to give us some permissions to to go in there and and look at these. Any questions at this point? That or they're all completely confused because 
It's all going over their heads. So one of the two. I hope that's not the case. Yeah. <laughs> How many credit hours is it worth? <laughs> All right, let's see if that. <laughs> Nobody wants that. Um, in that case, let's go ahead and take like maybe just a five minute break or so. Uh, just relax a little bit and we'll come back and we'll uh, talk about our scheduler and how all that goes together. Uh, how many of you have, before I do that, how many of you have not seen Bayocat? We will go down there and, and give a tour at the end if you have anybody who wants to go. Does anybody want to go? You want to go? Anybody want to go see? Yeah. Okay. We'll do that. At, yeah. Go see. The, go see it at the. Yes. At at the end. Well, well, not not now. We'll do we'll do that right at the end of the class. So, but I'm just trying to get a feel for if that's something we wanted to do. So, a lot of times, a lot of times these introduction classes, people have not actually seen it. So, we'll take you down and give you a quick tour at the end. Just trying to drive everyone to stay till the end. <laughs> or you could just go stay down there by it. I don't care. I'm, doesn't matter me one way or the other. All right, so uh, about five minutes here. We'll uh, take a quick break, and uh, we'll take it from there. You want me to dive in on the other stuff? Well, I was just, you do, there's a page on the languages and stuff. You do want to scroll? It's not too scroll? Control. Oh, control, control scroll. Control and scroll. I just want to tell that in the chat. Nice. We'll leave it that about that big. That'll work. And if any of you guys want the microphone, you're more than welcome to take it from here. Like I said, I'm just the guy that likes to talk. So I think there's another one that we did that too. Well, they do it both. Same time. Okay. Well, the next section there's a section on going through the languages and stuff like that. It's mm -hmm. pretty brief. So here's what our here's how you run an R code, that kind of stuff. Okay. Well, we got to go through the scheduler I'm first, go though. The slurm stuff. So why don't I go through the slurm and case stuff? Okay. And then I can do the language stuff. And the stuff after that was modules. I use modules. And then so just doing the basics on the slurm. And, uh, right. And apparently, I'm not smarter than the thing there. There we are. So, what are you doing next? Yeah. I'm walking into the touch of the problem. Mm -hmm. I guess you could always just select another session you have to do that. I'm going to get it in the right spot first and then we'll put this on at the end because it, it'll fall back off again as you're doing it. I've had this happen a few times. Still barely, barely hanging on there. I'm gonna come on. Has he seen you do more? Yeah. There we are. There you are. Yeah. Make sure they can hear you. Sometimes I'll leave it. Okay. Yeah, they f they figured out how, but if, so this is within MOBA X term.
So it's not supposed to be doing that. Yeah. That involves me uh, figuring out as uh, figuring out. Just click on the on the yeah, where's the session that star? Yeah, that's what I oh, clicked yeah. on. Yeah, yeah, just the left of the file browser. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm having trouble. Yeah. That? There you are. Nope, you're you're on it. You need to. Not here. Sessions. This is a mobile X term. You already have that one. Okay. That'll just create a new session there. This is creating a mobile X term session, or is this no, this, okay. is, this, is, this is this is logging in under the previously connected. So now you're logged in in this tab, and I'm logged in. You're just logged in and tapped out, or I'm logged in. And then control and scroll will make it bigger. Yeah, but it's still putting that header stuff in there for some reason. It's screwed up. It's putting the Selene in the, Selene in the uh, directory that it shouldn't be. So it's screwing something up. Oh well, I can live with it. And you said it's control and scroll. Okay, and how do I get to the web browser? Got it. Any idea what the command is to increase the font on this uh, on Chrome? Control plus. Dave's also got the worst eyesight of all of us. Yeah. <laughs> I'm older than you are. Okay, can everyone hear, hear me okay? So, for those of you who used uh, Bailcat previously, we used, uh, uh, before Christmas, uh, we were on a different flavor of Linux called Gentoo, and now we're on CentOS Linux. CentOS is a little more common uh, when it comes to uh, supercomputing. So this puts us a little more in, in the mainstream as far as our usage. We also converted over from SGE, which is a Sun Grid Engine uh, scheduler, over to Slurm. Slurm is also used more commonly in other uh, uh, supercomputing centers. So uh, this aligns us a lot more closely with what other places are doing. Uh, this does mean that uh, if you've used uh, our system before Christmas and haven't since, you have to recompile your code. Uh, there are different things that you have to learn, like submitting a job is different with Slurm than it is with, uh, with SGE. And we also manage things using modules, uh, which makes it much easier to switch. If you want to use different versions of MPI, you can switch in between. We have uh, certain applications that are loaded by doing a module load, for example. So what I'm going to do is go through some of the basics of how to use our current system. Um, some of what's in here is also how to convert your old scripts to new scripts as well. So 
uh, I'll just start here from the scratch. Uh, one of the first things to know is, again, the use of modules. There's probably about 100 modules or so that you can choose from. And to list those, you do a module avail to get the list of available modules. Then to load a module, if you are using the application VASP, for example, you would do a module load of VASP. And capitalization does count. You can then do a module list. And if you did these other two commands, if you did the module load of VASP and then do a module list, what you'll see is that it actually loaded a bunch of other modules that VASP depends on. So VASP, for example, in order to run it, depends on an MPI library, so it loads OpenMPI. That's one of the nice things about modules is that it has all the dependencies in there for you. When you do a module load, it sets up those dependencies, it sets up all the paths that you need, so this would set up the path to uh, VASP underscore STD for the standard version of VASP. It also sets up any uh, library paths or environments. For example, if you load Python, it sets up your Python environment so you don't have to source that like you may have had to in the past. Um, let me just switch back and do that real fast. So so again, if you do a module avail, it'll list all these things. Uh, like boost is in there. There's a bunch of GCC stuff. So these are just an extensive list of what you can do. So here I'm just doing a grep, which is a search for VASP. And again, uh, what this is telling me is if I just do a module load of VASP, it's going to choose this last one because that's set up as the default D here. This one was compiled for IOMKL. IOMKL is a tool chain. It's the Intel compiler tool chain along with the uh, open MPI. The O stands for the open MPI stuff. MKL is the math kernel library that comes with the Intel stuff. So anytime you see IO MP, excuse me, IO MKL, that just means it's compiled with all the Intel tool chain. Uh, this one here was compiled with GNU stuff. A lot of times with the GNU full, uh, tool chain, you'll see FOOS for free open, no, FOSS, free open software uh, system, free open, source. open source. free open source software. So those will be the main tool chains that you'll see a lot of the uh, applications using. So again, if we do a module load of VASP, then it'll say, oh, I changed all these things. I already had some modules loaded before. So it changed the GCC core from 7.2 down to 6.3. Uh, it changed the open M MPI version and some other things like that. So the thing you should remember here is that when you're running an application, it'll set all these things up for you. If you have certain uh, modules that you use a lot, you can put them in your bash RC file. So I'm gonna look at my bash RC file and I put them after this conditional. This conditional is the test for whether the shell is interactive or not. And I put down a module load of IOMKL because I want the Intel compilers there. I also want a newer version of Perl, the 5.26 version. 
So I always also have that so that it always uses that. Um, so you can put your modules uh, uh, in your bash RC file if they're ones that you use regularly. Um, because I have those in there, when I loaded VASP, it said, well, the versions that you had in there were not the ones I need for VASP, so it reloaded the correct ones. So now if I do a module list, again, there's the Perl that I loaded. Um, let's see, VASP is down here, and then OpenMPI is here. So now, uh, if I do a which VASP STD, which is the binary that I'm running, uh, it knows right where to look for it because that path was set up. So this is a nice thing about modules is that once you, so if you're running an application and it's in a module, you just do a module load and everything gets set up for you. So if I, again, I need to do MPI run to run VASP, uh, that's already set up as well. So it knows the path to get the, to the appropriate version of MPI run. So that's kind of the uh, uh, basics of using uh, modules. Um, on Wednesday, we'll cover a lot more uh, in-depth uh, issues about modules, some more advanced stuff. So if you're using custom codes that are not in a module, uh, you may have to compile those yourself. Uh, probably the first thing to do is if it's a, if it's a uh, program that's not listed when you do module avail, and, but you think other people around the university might use that, uh, you should probably contact us first because there might be an easy build. An easy build is how these modules are set up. Um, so it may be something that that we say, well, other people might want to use that, so we'll go ahead and make a module for you. But other than that, if you have custom uh, software, uh, it's your responsibility to compile that on your home directory, and we're available to help you. You did say help, though. We're not going to do it for you. <laughs> yeah. You show, show us that you've actually done a little bit with it. We're more than happy to help you. There are too many people around campus for us to do. Everybody's working with us. So, so give it a shot. If you have problems, then, then contact us. We'll, we'll have you help out. Yeah, and again, the uh, module load of IOMKL is the Intel stuff. The module load of FOSS includes not just the GNU compiler, but kind of the equivalent of what's in the math kernel library, uh, but on the GNU tool chain. So that would also load OpenBLOSS, which is an optimized uh, BLOSS library, uh, the FFTW library, and ScalaPack. Okay, so as far as running your code, if you ran under SGE, you will have a script similar to this that you used QSub with. With Slurm, Everything up here basically has a different syntax down here, but it's mostly a one-to-one -one matching. So before where you had a pound dollar sign, so before where you had a pound dollar sign up here for your Q sub commands, here you have a pound S batch. Instead of doing a minus J, oh, this is a join. So that joins the input and, or the standard in and standard error. That's done automatically down in S batch. So here I have a use current working directory. That's also done automatically. Here you specify the name with a minus capital N. So I named it NetPipe. Here you do a minus minus job dash name equals NetPipe. So you can see there's a, a lot of times a one-to-one -one conversion. So what I did is I actually wrote up a Perl script, 
kstat.convert, where you give it a Q sub uh, script, and then you do a minus minus slurm and give it the slurm script that you want the, it named. And that will automatically take this and convert it into one of these. Um, it's pretty good. I haven't had too many people complain about uh, there being anything left out. Uh, and if there's anything it can't handle, it'll normally give you a, uh, a warning message saying you need to handle this. Um, so if you do have old QSub scripts, you can automatically convert them again using kstat.convert. With sbatch, just a few things that I'll mention is the direct conversion, we use memory per CPU, which is the same we did under QSub. So right now, this is asking for one node, 32 tasks on that node, four gigabytes of memory per CPU. A CPU is a core. So since we asked for, or a task. So since I asked for 32 tasks in this case, I'm asking for four gigs times 32 as the total memory. The other way to ask for memory is to use minus minus mem equals, then you can specify the total memory per node. So again, this would be node. If you still are asking for four nodes, 32 uh, cores per node, so one of our dwarves, four of our dwarves, uh, this is still putting in a request per node. But if, if you find that's more convenient than per core, uh, that's just fine. Either one is, is, is fine. The time is a little different in that you can specify days it's days, dash, hour, hour, colon, minute, minute, colon, second, second. So uh, with time, again, you can just specify the days before a dash. Um, I recommend, there's different ways of asking for nodes, I rec or cores. I recommend using the nodes and tasks per node uh, as a general way of doing that. Uh, if you, that gives you a regular arrangement so that you can ask for like four nodes, four tasks per node, and you can control things very accurately. If you don't care where your tasks are, uh, like if you have an embarrassingly parallel code and it doesn't matter whether they're on the same machine or spread across machines or not, you can use just minus minus n tasks equal 12 and it'll just spread them across anywhere. But a lot of codes, uh, we had one today that I think Adam pointed out where they're running a classical MB code and spreading it over multiple machines. Well, the, the communications is slower across or between machines than it is if they're in the same machine. So that code is going to be running slower than it should be. So if you use the minus minus nodes and the end tasks per node, that allows you to control things uh, better than uh, some of the other options. We'll go over more options uh, on Wednesday. This last stuff, you can have it mail, uh, you can have it send you email um, when, the, when your job begins, ends, and if it fails in the middle. Right now I have it sent to all, uh, We'll cover on Wednesday how you split that up. I think you just put this, begin, comma, fail, would just give you those two, or begin, comma, end. And then here's, the, here's where, so all these up here are commands that go to the uh, uh, Slurm scheduler to tell it how to allocate nodes. This line here is where we told to run the code. So I'm running my NetPipe code, I'm telling it to use MPI run because it's an a MPI code is a multiprocessor code. NP tells it how many uh, cores to run on, and this is an environment variable. Slurm nprox is the number of processors that you asked for. This is the application, the NetPipe application, and then these are the parameters. So again, everything, all the sbatch commands 
uh, or what you're telling the scheduler and how to allocate uh, how to allocate machines and memory and so forth. So this kind of goes over some of the memory and tasks options that I mentioned before. And again, if you're interested in more advanced uh, use of Slurm, uh, then you should come on Wednesday, at least for the first hour, as we'll cover a lot more advanced things on modules on using Slurm and things like that. So let's just start by talking about submitting your first job. Once you have a script, you just use sbatch to submit that script. sbatch and then the script name. And then you can use kstat to see that it's been submitted. So kstat, the one that I use commonly is minus minus me. That'll tell information about just your jobs. So let's go ahead and do the, a quick one here. So my sbatch script, I have it called sb, short for sbatch dot test, oops. sb dot sleep. Again, the first line is just telling it you're in the bash shell. The minus L is necessary to tell it that it's a login shell. I named this one sleep. I gave it, uh, this is something that won't come up very often. I told it to wait 10 hours before it runs. And you don't want to do that normally. You want it to run as fast as possible. So I just do this because I want it to sit in the, in the queue so I can show you. I limit it to one hour. Um, these I have commented out because I put a second pound sign there, but some of you will have priority uh, to run in certain, on certain machines. So this gives me priority. This line would give me priority to run in the CIS HPC group, which is just the Baocat group. Uh, this would give me priority to run in Christine Aiken's group. She's a chemistry professor. So I'm asking for one node, four cores on that node, 10 gigabytes total. And then I'm asking for specifically one node here. So ignore these two in general for right now. We'll cover those more on Wednesday then these are the commands that are actually gonna run. It's just gonna list the host name, and then it's gonna sleep for uh, 3,600 seconds. So the host name just prints out the host name, which is Celine in this case. So to submit that, I do an sbatch, sb.sleep, and it says it submitted it just fine. If it has any problems with that, it would tell you and then if you don't know why, that's what you email us, is to copy that and, and say, hey, I submitted this job. It gave me this output. That will give us the job number and the error code. So I'm gonna do a case stat minus minus me. And it takes about five seconds because KSTAT is a Perl program that I wrote up. It goes out and gets a lot of information from different places, colorizes it, and presents it to you uh, in a more readable form. So it says the only thing I have running is in the Baocat queue. It's me as a username. I named it sleep. This is the user ID. It's on four cores, and it's pending. This is in yellow because I put it on hold. And then I asked for 10 gigabytes requested, and it's been in the queue for zero minutes. Just some more things about kstat. If you do kstat minus minus help, it will give you this help information. Some general usage, if you just wanna look in the queue, you do kstat minus queue. Um, 
if you do case stat alone, it'll give you basically information about all the hosts and all the jobs running on the host and everything in the queue. Uh, case stat minus C will give you information about what's running on the on it. So let's uh, let's start out with just doing case stat and looking at some stuff. So all this stuff at the bottom, first of all, it tells you how many cores are being used. So we're running at about 83% with 43 nodes down. There's a lot of those that are just kind of dead. Uh, these are all the users submitting jobs. So this user is submitting a lot of jobs for one core. The underscore and then this means it's an array job. So they submitted 16 jobs at once, for example. They're asking for 512 megs, and some of these jobs have been waiting for three hours and 35 minutes. Anytime you have this, which is actually more of an orangish color, uh, that means they submitted to, they have priority on certain machines. So this person is Jeff Comer, he has priority on his own machines. Uh, this user, Luke, has priority on uh, Amir Bahadori's nodes. And you see mine up there at the top. Uh, I have high priority just in general being one of the administrators. So that's why mine's at the top. It's not running because I, again, told it to wait 10 hours because I'm not very smart. Right. OK, so these are up here are the jobs that are actually running. So you can see the first thing is the, this is the name of the, the node. A mole is one of the classifications of our nodes. These are some of our newer ones. 20 of the 20 cores are full. The load is 19.6 out of 20, which is good. If the load level is much lower than the core count, that means someone's running inefficiently. This is something I look at every day, and then I'll, I'll try to figure out why, and I'll email that person and say, hey, look, you're, you asked for 16 cores, but you're only using one. This is what's wrong in your code. Let's fix it so you can use all 16. Just because you asked for 16 cores doesn't mean that your code can use those. That's one common misperception. Uh, this is the amount of memory that's being used on that host. It is not very accurate. It sometimes counts disk cache in there. Uh, and then this is the owner clear off to the right here. So anyone from their group gets priority. This is the person running there is Mike. This is the job name. He's running on all 20 cores. This is in red. Red means it's a killable job. That means he's not actually in that group, but no one from that group is using that node. So it will run killable jobs. Killable jobs are anything 24 hours or less. So if you submit a job for 24 hours or less, it'll get flagged automatically as killable and run on machines that are owned by other people. So that's a good thing, but if one of their users comes along, it'll kill that job off and put theirs on. It'll automatically reschedule your job though, so you don't have to do anything about it. And then uh, that's why we say only 24 hours or less because we don't want you to waste, you know, we don't want you to get 12 hours in or we don't want you to run a three day job and then have it killed off and have you start from scratch. Again, with, with the old system, with SGE, we were able to pick up very accurate uh, indications of how much memory uh, your code used. With Slurm, we just can't do that right now. Um, and that's something that we're still working on. Uh, when you request, when you put in your SBatch script, you have to request a given amount of memory if you're running to start with, 
You just have to guess right now. Um, if you exceed that amount of memory, your code can run slower because you hit disk swap. So it is important to overestimate. If you overestimate by too much, you can limit yourself to what nodes you're running on and things like that. A good first guess is to start out with about four gigs per core, because that's typically what most of our systems have. Um, if you need to know more exactly, if you're running large memory things, like if you're in chemistry or biology, uh, you can use Ganglia, which is one of our websites, and we'll go into that a little bit more probably on Wednesday on uh, how to look at the memory there. It's a little more in depth. But just be aware that uh, with KSTAT, I do try to pick up the amount of memory that you're actually using but I only see it displayed maybe one out of 20 or 30 times. And it's just not clear why that doesn't come through more easily. So let's see if there's anything else that comes up. So these are totally empty. So uh, they're waiting for someone to run on. They are owned uh, by some group. So maybe we just don't have enough killable jobs available in the queue. Is that a minus sign there? Yeah. yeah. So some more empty nodes, but yeah. So we have some moles that are available. So anyway, those are some of the things that you can look at with KSTAT. Another thing you can do with KSTAT is do a KSTAT minus C. That'll give you kind of a summary of the core usage. Um, so this will tell you each user how many cores they are currently running on and how many they have in the queue. Uh, the colorization, green means me. I have four cores queued up. Red in general just means you're using more than 10% of all the cores. Uh, yellow is, I think, more than 5%. So it doesn't mean that you're really doing anything wrong. It just highlights the bigger users. And in this case, for example, this person uh, is using 14% uh, of all the cores, but uh, his major prof professor also owns a lot of the cores. So uh, he has every right to uh, uh, use a lot. So that just kind of can give you a, a summary of the core usage. Okay, so again, case that minus me, let's get back to the uh, script that I submitted. And again, it's gonna be just sitting there in the queue again, because I told it to wait for 10 hours. So what if I decide that uh, uh, I want to cancel this. You use the s cancel command, and then let's see, that's one seven zero six nine eight. So the s, s cancel will just simply kill the job off. Uh, when you submit jobs, it doesn't necessarily, uh, well, it'll submit them right away. Uh, even if there's open nodes, it may not run them right away. It does take Slurm you know, a few minutes to uh, figure out, even if there's open nodes to get your job running. You can see it canceled things uh, very quickly. Um, one note on this, we do have a professor who is uh, working on analyzing, part of his research is he's analyzing uh, the reasons behind why people use S-cancel. And so part of his research, he wants data on uh, why people are doing an S-cancel. So what he's asked is that people load a module for S-cancel
And what that module will do is when you do the same S cancel, it will simply prompt you to put in uh, the name of the application that you're running and then the reason for why you're doing the S cancel. Uh, this will help him with his research. It helps give us some feedback uh, on things like, well, are you canceling your code because you gave it a certain amount of time to run and you're running out of time, so you're canceling it because of that. So we can get statistics on how much of system time is being wasted because there's that hard time limit. And is that something we can give feedback to the people who do the scheduler to make it maybe more of a soft time limit or something like that, it could be extended. So we wanna do things like this to try to help uh, improve uh, the system. So he's uh, encouraging people to do this. Uh, Dan is also going around trying to convince the uh, professors that own some of these nodes to mandate that everyone that works for them uh, opt in. The way to opt in is to put this module load of S cancel in your bash RC, your dot bash RC uh, file. So I should have done that in fact. So let's go through this process. So now it gives me uh, the application name and I'm just gonna put sleep, that's, yeah, I'll just put test so he knows to delete me, uh, to delete this entry. But if I was running VASP, for example, I would put VASP in there. Uh, there's, whatever the name of your code is, uh, try to keep it simple. If you're running a classical molecular dynamics code, code there's a common one, NAMD, N-A-M-D, for nanoscale molecular dynamics, that's what you would enter here. Now it's giving a variety of multiple choice bins that you can choose from. I'm gonna choose bin B because this is a training workshop. But you wanna to try to uh, determine which of these best fits you. If you made an error with your script, uh, then you'd put D1. If uh, it was an error with your application parameters, D2, and so forth. So we've tried to uh, uh, simplify it so there's bins to put in. So again, I'm gonna put B here. Um, you see at the bottom is other. If you wanna enter other, you don't put other in, you just put the reason in in free form and it'll store that. But otherwise you can just do multiple choice and this'll do the S cancel and it'll log that information for him. So we've made it as easy as possible. Uh, and again, it'll help him with his uh, research then. So, oops. The tilde here means go to my home directory and then the bash RC. So if I wanted to do a module load of S cancel, So now I'm opted in, oops, no I'm not. So now I'm opted in. And yeah, so now I'm opted in and Venkatesh will be happy with me until I comment it out later. <laughs> Okay, so any questions about doing the simple job submission and some case stat stuff? Okay, and we wanna do 15 minutes for the tour. 10 or 15, okay. So submitting your first job. Okay, monitoring your job, went through that. 
And again, with KSTAD, there's a lot of stuff in there. You're just going to have to play around. And if you have any questions, you can always ask me. Oh, one of the things that's nice about KSTAD is if you submit a job and, and want to know why it's not running or information like that, you can do a KSTAD minus J and give it the job number. And that'll print out the job here, and it'll print out a lot of other information here. Um, so let's actually go and do that because it'll be colorized. So again, K stat minus J, and then I gave it the job number. So up at the top, it shows that it's in the queue, and it shows the information that K stat would normally give you. But I also grabbed information from another place and highlighted it. So the highlighting stuff is, is things that you can look at. The status is listed as pending. The reason is given here is that I, I specified a beginning time. Other reasons it can put up here are resources, meaning it just uh, doesn't have the resources. Uh, it can also say priority, meaning other people have more priority than your job. Um, gives you the time limit here. This is the one that I highlighted most. This is estimated start time. A lot of times you'll submit a job, this estimated start time, if it says it's gonna start in three days, don't really worry so much about that. This is worst case scenario. It looks at the current state of the system and it says uh, if all these jobs finish when the person says that it's gonna finish, uh, in other words, it's taking the hard time limit, then this is when you'll get your job scheduled. So we have people who submit jobs and always put 28 days down because that's the maximum time. So these are not always that accurate. Um, so take this as a worst case scenario. And if it does say two weeks, uh, then you might wanna contact us. But uh, under normal circumstances, uh, this will keep moving up as other jobs finish before their specified time. Um, one thing to look at that's useful is the partitions that you're in. So if you do have priority to run on certain machines, uh, this is a good way to check and make sure that that came through and that it's actually looking and putting you in your priority queue. Now this also put, this put me in the killable queue because it's a job that's shorter than 24 hours and also in the batch queue, the general one. I didn't specify a given list. And this is the other line to look at um, because this is how many nodes and how many cores I requested as well as the memory request. Then it actually lists your script. It does, uh, I have it uh, getting rid of all the comments and stuff, but it does actually list your script. This makes it easier on me in particular because if you send me information saying this job doesn't work, this is the first thing I'm gonna do is look at this and then it pops up where your script is here and what your script is. So if you do just give me the job number and don't give me the path and so forth and the uh, script, I can pop that up. Any questions on that? Okay. So I covered the case stat minus C. Okay, more information is in advanced slurm. That's what we're gonna cover 
on Wednesday, advanced modules, advanced stuff on Slurm, NAS batch. Okay, the last thing we're gonna to cover today is on uh, some of the software that's installed and this is mostly dealing with how to run the, uh, using different languages. Uh, for a complete list of installed modules, the module list, I already showed you how to use module avail. So we'll go over this a little bit more and tool chains more on Wednesday. Again, the uh, main tool chains are the FOSS, the free open uh, software stuff, and then the IOMKL stuff. You can specify subsets of that, like just ICC, for example, or I4, the Intel stuff, that in general, this will get you the whole package. Okay, most commonly used software, open MPI. Again, MPI is, the message passing interface that allows you to run multi-processor jobs where the uh, processes can either be in on cores in the same node or they can be on cores in different nodes. And again, you do a module load of open MPI and that'll set up your MPI run, which is how you launch them. It'll also set up your compilers which are like MPI CC is your C compiler and MPI Fort, for example, for your Fortran compiler. Um, I'll go over those more on Wednesday in the second hour for those of you who want to know more in depth about parallel computing. I'll probably tell you more than what you want to know about parallel computing. So, um, R, the R language, uh, a lot of people are used to using R from the command line. So you can actually get in on the head node and type capital R and it'll give you the command prompt and you can do things on the head node. You just have to do small things. Uh, you'd have to do the module load of R first, uh, but you can do small things. Uh, to use R on, on the compute nodes, uh, so there's your module load R and starting R. You want to start by installing packages on the head node if you need them. So you can't put, so you're gonna, when you run an R job in batch mode on Baocat, you're gonna put all your R commands into one file and you're gonna submit them in your script. You can't do install packages in there because install packages will prompt you for things like what mirror do you want to use? What site do you want to download things from? So the install packages command is one thing that you need to do uh, before you submit a job with sbatch. Then in your script, you can use the library command to load them. Uh, let's see. Okay, that, I think there's a mod or there's a library load or something. Yeah, I'm, I'm not an R person really, so. So in your script then, you have your normal sbatch commands up here that, uh, where you request certain numbers of tasks. <laughs> then you can put the module load R in your script. So this is something I didn't mention before. If you're gonna use a module, like again, if you're running VASP, uh, you can do that interactively and do a module load VASP. And then when you submit your job, you can just use the application VASP under, underscore standard. And you don't have to put a module load in your script if you don't want. When you submit a job to SBatch to, to the scheduler, it takes your current environment and all the modules you have loaded and passes that along uh, when it uh, spins things up on the compute node. It's a good idea, however, to do it this way. If you're going to be reusing a script, it's not a bad idea to put your module loads in that sbatch script, uh, just so that you make sure that you're running with the same modules all the time. 
in fact, one of the things that I do uh, is I'll do a module purge, which starts with a, bank a blank slate, and then I'll, mo I'll do a module load of the exact modules that I want to use. That way I guarantee that each time I submit it, I get the same set of modules. And if you really want, you can put a module list afterwards, so it lists those uh, and puts that in your output file, your log file. So again, for R, we're doing a module load R, then we're doing an R minus no save minus Q, and we're piping in our uh, commands. So this is how you run R in a batch mode. So it's different from running it interactively. You have to put all your commands in the, the uh, script here and then use that as piping it in from standard in to R. Then you submit your script and it'll run it in a batch mode. So any questions about that? We have Java. That's the extent of my knowledge about Java. <laughs> Any questions on that for Adam? And again, one of the nice things about modules is, uh, I'll mention this here. So uh, for Python, it's very common that some Python codes need uh, Python 2 and others need Python 3. This is the nice thing about Python is that you can load the version that you want. Uh, if you just say module load Python, it will choose one of these, which is the default. The last. the last one. So it'll choose this last one, which is Python 363 with the uh, Intel build. If you need Python 2, then you should do a module load of this whole line here to specify the whole thing. And you can, again, choose whether to do the Intel build or the, there's a couple different GNU builds here. So that is one of the nice things. Uh, doing a module load of Python then, uh, for example here, will set up uh, some of your virtual environments. There's a little more information about setting up. Yeah, do you want to comment on any of this, Adam? Um, previously we were using uh virtual EMB wrapper, uh, this is basically wrapper was wrapping all of these commands. And so this is just maybe slightly harder, but also more straightforward in that if something breaks, you can see what broke. Yeah, so we had a lot of people, uh, when we did the changeover, uh, that still had that sourcing of the virtual EMV wrapper. And they said, well, this doesn't work anymore, so it's broken. Now it's, it's actually that you don't need that, uh, but you need the functionality. So uh, you should, uh, if you're using Python, you should uh, log in and or look at the website and here and uh, see what you actually need to do. That's a little different. And then this right here is how you do Python install stuff with pip install. Okay, Perl, uh, again, I use the newer version, so I, there is a, a default version uh, that's available. I use a, new, a newer version, the 5.26, because I need access to a lot of the colorization stuff. Uh, and again, so I just do a module load of the Perl 5.260. Submitting a Perl job, again, you can do the module on Perl, uh, and then you do Perl, and then the Perl code. Uh, you can also just specify the Perl code in there. Okay. Installing your own software. Uh, I think we're going to cover that on Wednesday. How are we on time? Okay. So. Let's open it up for questions again, and then uh, uh, we'll take everyone on a tour who wants to. Any questions or comments? Uh, yeah. Um, do you mean by this installing my own software? It's like if I'm using Eden, so. Right. 
Or, yeah. So if you're using. It's actually a special case, too. You probably want to take a handout. If I actually have it in the online, I think it, I don't know, I have two other benefits. But it's definitely not a good thing. Uh, you have this, you have know, licensed software, it's a whole different kettle of fish. As you probably need to drop it down. Yeah. Uh, I need to do it. Yeah. And again, anything having to do with the licensing system, you're best to touch base with us first. Probably ninety percent of the software that we run is what we call GPL, which is you know open source software. It's free to use. With, there's no licensing issues with it. The ones that aren't, you know, that, that other 10% that we need to take care of. Any more questions? So again, on Wednesday, we're planning on going more in depth on some of these issues like modules and especially going over more on Slurm, uh, talking about things like array jobs and environment variables and things like that. Um, We'll also get into more uh, software installation. And so the first hour will be a lot more of those advanced topics. The second hour will be me talking about parallel computing. So I will talk about what a parallel computer is, some of the different hardware aspects, programming it in MPI and OpenMP. I'll just give some basic examples, kind of to give you an overview of what that's about. I'll talk about job performance of parallel applications, communication, stuff like that. So you're welcome to come for both hours. If you want to cut out after one hour, that's fine. Uh, so just kind of pick and choose. If there is something that you think you'd like us to cover on Wednesday, uh, let us know. So any other questions? Okay, well, thank everyone. I'd like to thank everyone for coming and anyone who wants a tour, uh, we'll just lead you down uh, downstairs and get a quick uh, 10 or 15 minute tour.